football. And I realized that I'm using my knowledge of football and my life experience to coach these kids. So I coach them every day uh, from four to six. But then we talk about philosophies, capitalism versus socialism. We talk about ethics. Uh, can I tell you, my sister Nancy, I probably derive more joy uh, coaching those kids and actually making money coaching people and building community with them. Hello, family. You are listening to Concrete Pastures Podcast. I am Nancy Mulemwasisi. Thank you so much for tuning in today. For anyone who is new on our platform, this is a space that allows myself and others to share our stories as we deconstruct the world's view of an immigrant status. We unlike the joys, the laughs, and the bravery that being a dreamer brings. So subscribe, like, share, and stay a while as we dive into today's episode. Today, I am sitting down with an amazing amazing gentleman, a brother now, who is impacting our community in a very inspirational way. Um, who are we sitting down with today? We're sitting down with Mosito Rama Ili. He's a visionary cultural marketing leader, dedicated father, husband, co-founder of Brooklyn Stars Football Club. We're going to talk about that all around a representative of Africa excellence. Welcome, brother. How are you? I'm good, my sister. How are you doing today? Mulishan. <laughs> wow, you just made my day. <laughs> nice. it's, a, it's, a, it's an honor to finally make my, my debut, uh, the concrete pastures sitting here in the concrete jungle. So it feels like it's all, um, it, it was a matter of time. So it's an honor for me to be in dialogue with my sister. Oh my God, for anybody, translation, Mishani means how are you in one of our languages in Zambia. My language is Lozi, it's close to, I think, Zulu, one of the languages in SA, which is Muchwani. That's how we say hello with us. Oh. But, yeah. Muchwani, that's, that's actually very similar to Ama Musoto. We say Fujuang and Isitwana, which is geographically close to Zambia. What is Muchwani in Zim? Uh, like it's the same thing. So, I mean, we. I think one thing about as Africans, um, first of all, borders are made by the colonizers, right? Yeah. Uh, and then the other the other thing that we have to accept is that we're all part of the Bantu uh, group of languages. We all migrated down from like the present days are here. So like all, so it's no coincidence that you pick up a lot of Swahili and Zulu and Swan and Sut and all these languages. Sure. We all we all connected but I uh, obviously like I said, like you know, it's just the practices, the partitioning of Africa. We consume uh, ourselves according to these borders and these names that the Westerners have given our land. But be that as it may, I uh, use them and I'm so African, but I'm happy to TV coming to you, my sister. Oh, I'm so excited for this conversation. You are impacting our community in a way that is so positive. And um, I wanted for you to share your story with us, uh, for us to be inspired by the work you are doing in our community. Um, but for starters, you were doing amazing <laughs> in SA. How was life in SA? And uh, what yeah. got you to moving to the US of A? To the US? Um, look, I mean, SA, I always regard South Africa's paradise. On, you know, it's heaven on earth. Uh, we, I mean, it's, it's a I agree. Of the cradle of human kind. Of, I think for us, we, with, with all the beach that it has, I think for me, we always talk about the human capital. I think as Africans, uh, I think our humanity and this Ubuntu, which is this humanist philosophy that we're led by, um, Ubuntu uh, literally is loosely translated as I am, I am because we are, right? So as Africans, uh, our humanity is defined by how we present uh, our humanity to the next person. So we can't afford to be assholes. So that's why uh, as so Africans, especially with diaspora, it's, it's important that we espouse all these virtues because the narrative, we don't own the narrative, right? Because if you look at the narratives and stuff like xenophobia, all these things. So that's why for me, as you're saying, uh, the work that I'm doing, honestly, it's, it's just it's a calling, you know, as, as, as Africans, uh, Fela Kuti always said that as us, we're messengers of our community. So like, uh, so we see that our, the narratives of our countries and our continent are on a larger scale are, 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 are not congruent to what we know, what we see. It's incumbent on us to say, no, hang on, Lusaka is not like that, Livingston is not like that, Kampala, Uganda is not like that. I've been there, you know, so that's why for me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a true African in the sense that I, I, I know our story. Our story didn't start at the, you know, the Dove Nori to Nagori Island in Senegal or in Ghana and like our, our stories are way before that. We're, we're, we're coming to North America and trading with, the, with these people a long time ago. If you go to Mexico, we've 
been traveling, like, you know, so um, so it's on us to change this narrative. Um, it's, it's, it's absolutely incumbent. So that's why uh, as an African, as a proud African, um, it's, it's my calling to do this. No, it's it's really beautiful. For me, mm. who follows you on social media, <laughs> every day is so inspirational. Like I have Thank even, you. like I took a screenshot of what you posted yeah. literally a few minutes wow. ago. Wow. And I'm like, I'm going to ask him, for anybody who's not <laughs> following him, please do. <laughs> you will be inspired. Wow. Um, but before we get into the mm-hmm. nitty-gritty, how did yeah. you get to come to New York? Let the people all, know all, how, you all, get, how you came here. Yeah, New York. Uh, so I was working in South Africa. Uh, my role back then was a brand director for Nike. Uh, Nike Africa was the title. So I was working in the football category. So my markets were South Africa, Nigeria, Algeria, Morocco, and Egypt. So my role was to, um, I guess, I was, uh, what's the English word? I guess I was the evangelist of Nike in Africa. So, um, so one of the things that I did, one of my biggest accomplishments, was that I really took pride in. I signed the Nigerian Football Federation to Nike and if I can tell you, um, it was a mission to convince people in Portland that to take a bet on an African nation for them, they thought that, oh, there's no spending power, there's not this, there's not that. And for me, my argument, or rather my repartee, because you don't need to argue when you're speaking for Africa because the facts speak for themselves. Yes. Uh, it was simple. Like I said, listen, guys, there's uh, over 120 million Nigerians in Nigeria. There's 200 million in the diaspora and there's anything about Nigerians. They have pride in that white and dreams. So if you're not going to back the most populous nation on the continent, also one in every third black people in the world are Nigerian. So you actually are doing a disservice to this brand. So um, so it's a two-year process. So sorry, I, I, I know I talk a lot, but this was between 2000 and, 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 and 15 and 16 when we were having this conversation. And when Nike finally came to the realization that Nigeria and Africa is actually a, a, a destination or a market that people actually have spending power. We then um, we, we then uh, launched the World Cup jersey in the 2018 World Cup jersey. I don't know if you remember that, that, that famous Nigerian jersey. We sold 3 million units um, in, in the space of 30 minutes. Those jerseys were, were, were out of sale within the first hour of going to sell. So like that showed you that Africans do have spending uh, ability. You know what I mean? So for me as an African, as a part of African, like working for these, these big corporates, like for me, like I've always made it a point to, to, to stake a claim for my country and for my people. So I'm, I moved to New York purely. Um, so I, I had some success for Nike on the continent. Then they moved me to Nike UK. I worked very closely with the English Football Federation. I ran a program called Nike Academy and the premise there was that all these kids, uh, so the inside came from South Africa and Southern Africa, we, all these talented African kids, like they're not going to get signed by Orlando Pires, kids and cheese and all these clubs but yeah. then it's not to say it's not to say they're failures. So for me, working at Nike, the insight was that why why don't you create a platform that gives these guys a second chance, um, you know, uh, and coming out of that Nike Academy, uh, we had trials, we had 5,000 uh, kids from Johannesburg and surrounding cities show up and out of those 5,000 we, we truncated down to 100 out of those 100 they got to stay and uh, they were part of this program for a year and we're traveling across the country playing those professional clubs in South Africa in Southern Africa with the hopes that they'll get signed and out of that we have five guys that have played professionally one of them plays for the biggest club in South Africa uh, 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 Kaiser Chief so these programs so there's evidence that we have talent on the continent and it's us to, to create space for, for all these talented uh, kids up and down the continent so I came to New York as a messenger of Africa uh, and opening pathways through football uh, for my mind. So it's, it's, it's very consistent with who I am as a person throughout my life. You know, I'm a child of an Africanist. My mom was an academic. My father was a lawyer. So we've always been taught uh, as a family to look inward. Uh, what solutions are you providing for the continent is always the first question I ask myself. Wow. No, you're, mm. um, you're definitely representing uh, because you. meeting you at the Heritage Party where we, we met a week or so ago, Yeah, it was amazing how you are such a storyteller and how you are passionate about representing the African continent not just South Africa itself the continent mm-hmm. itself and mm-hmm. how we have to act as Africans and how we have to tell our stories uh, and not let people truly tell our stories when they don't really know yeah. Africa like yeah. we, so the representation is definitely there the football space you've been in the football space for a while the post you yeah. just posted you are a football star I used to I used sorry to I'm nosy <laughs> no, 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 you're not, no, you know, um, you know, that was my dream growing up. I had dreams of being a football 
four star, you know, and, and, and I did everything to get myself there. So growing up uh, out of high school, I met the South African under 20 team. Uh, and then I got a, I got a contract. I was signed by a, a football club in South Africa called Jomo, Jomo Cosmos. Um, but then being a child of an academic, uh, my mother, so I, my mother sat me off and said, listen, I'm going to let you pursue this football team, but it better make sense. Uh, but then my mother being my mother, so they had us staying at some hotel in downtown Joburg. So my mother, uh, so just to give you context, so my mother used to stay three hours out of Johannesburg in a small town called Mapiteng. So Joburg, obviously, you know, African mother is a big city. And then so she came there and like, she just saw the living conditions, you know, and then uh, she's like, you know what, it's not going to work out. So my mother uh, had come to the US in, in the 80s on a, on a scholarship uh, yeah. to study. So then she quickly arranged a scholarship for me to come to the US. So I went to a school in Alabama and HBCU, historically black university, Alabama in there, to study marketing on a football scholarship. So wow. here, here I was at 18, I have just signed my contract and then my mom's like, you know what, rather get your academics, football's not going to go anywhere, which is probably the best thing that happened to me because I then came, I played four years and in those four years, I was the first team All-American in my, my junior year, so I got the recognition. Right. Uh, I got, And then I got to go back home and play. Unfortunately, I tore my ACL, but then luckily for me, I had a, I had a degree to fall back on. So then I quickly realized that if I'm not going to get paid to play football, I'm going to get paid to work in football. So I used my knowledge of the game and my marketing degree to sort of get back into the football space and sort of influence the game uh, differently. And, and I think that's always been the insight for me that as much as you, you, you don't get to, it, it, it's, it's the same in art. And that's why in, in marketing, a lot of people grow up wanting to be actors and musicians. Yeah. But then actually, the money is behind the screen. Even in football, you don't have to be a player to have a career in football. You can be an administrator and be a commentator. So like a, a big part of what I do in my life is to show people like the solution. So I'm a big uh, believer in providing solutions. So my life always been around solutions and I, and I prove it. So football is very integral in my life. It will never go away. Like I always say football is like and my mom knows, my wife knows when Arsenal's playing, uh, I'm not to be disturbed. Me and- no, I'm seeing, I'm seeing you guys were playing I think the other day. Yeah. Uh, your team was playing and I love the encouragement that you're giving. You know, you lose yeah. some, you win some. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, yes, I, I yes, love yeah. that. Yeah, I also, I know what you talk, you're talking about the high school team that I saw in my commitment to football and in my commitment to mentoring and legacy. So legacy is a big for me. I realize that as I work for myself, you actually do have time. There's this, uh, uh, this, this notion that oh, there's not enough time in the day, but there's actually time. So I've carved out three hours of my day. So between three, uh, so I'm lying. I coach between four to six, but between between three to six, I dedicate. So like from three, I, I, I put my laptop away and I start like lesson planning like these kids that I coach. So I coach a high school team, uh, a school, Berkeley Carroll in Park Slope in Brooklyn. So for me, the inside there, I wanted to touch these young boys for the real world gets to them, right? Because I think teen high school and going to college and then getting in corporate, like something happens where between philosophy, idealism and reality, yeah. we lose our way. So like I, I was using my experience and like that's why I want to go back. You know, and I, back home, I, I remember so they say young hands reach out and old hands reach in. So I'm reaching into these young kids. As these kids are reaching out because they want to, they love the game of football and I realize that I'm using my knowledge of football and my life experience to coach these kids. So I coach them every day uh, from four to six. But then we talk about philosophies, capitalism versus socialism. We talk about ethics. Uh, can I tell you, my sister Nancy, I probably derive more joy uh, coaching those kids than actually making money coaching people and building communities with adults because adults are very jaded, man. And kids, kids are few. And like, and, and you realize that kids, like, they're so honored. And that's what I love. That's why I love being around them. And that's why when I coach them, as much as they lose games, I I, I, I always leave the fact that, guys, take lessons from this. Because here's the, the truth is that you're going to lose a lot more than you're going to win in this life. So if you're going to get disappointed by losing your high school football game, then, then, you, then you lose in perspective. Perspective is, did I give my best? Did I, did I, did I, did I, did I? Was I of service to my teammates? Was I a fair sportsman in losing? You know what I mean? So like for me, that is what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in, 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 in guys that are going to win and gloat and show off. Because for me, winning for the most part, it, it, it masks so many deficiencies in people. We see all these winners in society, but as human beings, they're terrible. You know what I mean? I'd rather have well-rounded young kids and human beings that see themselves as part of a solution versus people that, that walk around this alpha uh, behavior thing that they're better than everyone. There's no glory in that. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, I think a lot of uh, our kids need the mentors that mm-hmm. have been through it and they've been through life and they're able to mentor them, especially uh, boys and girls, not mm-hmm. not even like just the boys. Boys and Absolutely. girls, we, we need a lot of role models that are going to teach them. Like failure is part of 
life mm -hmm. because we beat ourselves up. I think we take it hard because of our culture now as to we have to win. I, I was recently talking about this because even school is made up that way that there's always going to be a winner and a loser. So if that's what is being put in our children's heads, they're going to grow up that way as finding failure as the worst thing ever. And if we're teaching them that failure is a teachable moment for you, you are able to get up and learn from those mistakes and not just to make it as yeah. a failure. And, and it's a great point, right? And that's where culture comes into play, right? Because in our cultures, there is no such thing as, as winners and losers. There's wisdom and those that are not wise. But in the Western society, so the Western society says that in order for you to be great, there has to be a loser. Mm -hmm. But the but the world is telling us that is not right. That's why I mean I'm not gonna go into the territory of politics, but you see what's happening in the world, like this whole homogenous uh mindset where the West this paternalistic mindset that the West has had towards the, the continental South Af the, the South Africa, Asia, South America. People are saying no, we want to multipolar but like look at me as a peer. And that is what life is about. Like this whole notion that second place is a loser, that is terrible. If I'm if I came second, that means I did ninety nine percent better than everybody else had competed. If I came lost in a race with eight other people, that means I was the eighth person to make it there. Fifty other guys couldn't make it to the starting level. So like it's all about how how we how we, 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 we reimagine language is very important. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. We need to re we need to reframe these constructs and we need to realize that we are as, as also us Africans, we 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 are living in we are living in a construct that is not innate to us. It's foreign. Like we're living in a Western construct that is foreign to us as Africans. First of all, it we you left Zambia, we first of all we talking in English. That already is like that. like so we as Africans like we we are we we pawn so much of our Africanness that we, we actually forget like what it is to be an African. You know what I mean? And that's why we judge ourselves according to the Western construct by me being an assistant brand manager I'm a failure because I'm not a brand direct things like that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah but that is what society has brought to us and we just go by whatever society is. It's just and, we have to continue to support each other by reminding each other no you did it you did good and, and, and that's what I'm saying that's what I'm saying I'm saying that we shouldn't frame ourselves and we shouldn't judge ourselves according to the standards of society because they are yeah. not true they are not real uh, true. you know and, uh, yeah what is real what, what is sorry what is real is that every day we make incremental uh, uh, improvement mm -hmm. that is what I'm interested in you know what I mean incrementally I'm, 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 I'm more confident to be in a dialogue with you versus maybe last week I was nervous too. like that is even, that is what we should be judging ourselves on as human beings like how, how are we incrementally as yeah, a society yeah definitely the growth the yeah. growth how are you um, I'm going to take you back How when you got yeah. to New York I know you yeah. being in the US was not first time but New York is animal by how were you able to integrate yourself here you know from rand to dollars yeah. how was that look, adjustment look, look I mean from rand to dollars um, look, it was tough that being said but culturally I think the, the, the cultural assimilation was the toughest as well because you know when you come from like a city where like you're the main guy and then you come here you realize that everybody's the main guy from where they're from and when they came to New York like you have to earn your stripes and yes. I think that's the beauty of New York but right? like you have to earn your stripes so the city will spit you it'll chew you it'll kick you it'll do everything but you realize that you have to get up every single morning and that's what I did like I honestly I'm one of those people like I, I just I just love people I'm, I'm a curious human being so I'd meet somebody from Ghana who, who would in turn introduce me to a person from Gambia who in turn is a friend from Kenya all of a sudden I have I have a network yeah. and then the next day if I go out there's a guy from Brooklyn who knows somebody from Bronx so like it, it, it's about like putting yourself out there so and I think a lot of us as Africans you know we, we come here with we think oh my ex and I sound different they're gonna laugh my clothes actually fit me they're gonna you know what I mean like so it's, it's a lot of these things that we tether ourselves so I, I had the same struggles in the first 18 months of the toughest you know what I mean yeah I was I was yearning for, for home by the way I got back when I got here it was just about to be winter so now it dark it dark at 4pm I'm an African I'm used to sun yes. till 8pm you know you're on the subway people are not even greeting you used to greeting everyone even strangers greeting you your neighbors can't even offer you sugar so culturally it was a shock and mind you because for me I had I, it, so it was six years from the last time I was here so yeah. I had to like re, I had to remember all those things that oh man it's like this again you know? so New York was definitely tough but once it starts opening up you find community so that's what so for me that's why I'm a big proponent in, in creating community because you realize that it's such an easy scaffolding you can't depend on your job uh, your, your colleagues at work to like help you assimilate so like yeah. so, so it, it's, it's about putting yourself out and like also my friend just keep like it's about finding uh, an, an interest point so for me it was soccer and football and music in Africa so those three things that is, that, that is how I was able to assimilate so I, I 
fun to meet around those intersections. No, that's beautiful because it's definitely New York is a diverse state. You yeah. find everyone from everywhere here, mm-hmm. and the the same challenges. We all have gone through the same challenges. Being homesick. Right now, yeah. I have a sister that just came from Zambia. She is mm. homesick mm. on some days. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I told her like this is the the, the growing pains yeah. of being an immigrant. Right. It's mm-hmm. part of it. But right now, it, it's amazing on how um, the communities that we now have. Like I joined without meeting you. Before I met you guys, I actually joined the community, the South African, uh, New Jersey and New York. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting, the stuff that they talk about in there. I'm like, I joined just because just I was curious. I was like, mm-hmm. let me see what other communities talk about. But how has being part of the community helped you? Because for me, it helped me tremendously because I'm able to learn what other people are going through and what's going on in our own community, our cultures. And uh, even when there's like an event, someone would invite, this is the event I'm having to keep that culture alive. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it's, it's definitely, it, it helps with the homesickness. It helps with the, uh, it helps with being engaged with what's happening at home. Yeah. Uh, so for me, it's it's actually different because I, mine is almost like an, uh, an uncle or leadership role. Yeah. So for me, because I, I, people come for me for all sorts of reasons. Like you have people like that have visa issues. Yeah. You know, so like, you realize that it's a home away from home. It's it's a literal home away from home. Like in the sense that even my house, I invite people to come in for a meal once a week because we cook because a lot of guys like they're students, like they don't even have like a home cooked meal. So you realize that like there's a lady, like and I'll just give you an exa- a, a practical example without mentioning names. I mean career wise she's a chartered accountant. She works for one of the biggest houses here, accounting firms. But she says so she she joined the group last year in in, in April, the first week of April. Yeah. She said that has she not heard of that group the last week of March, her bags were fully packed uh, Nancy she was ready to go back to South Africa that's how much dress she was so she had lived here for six months she hadn't come across a South African she hadn't come across food she hadn't even come across anybody from Southern Africa and then she says by chance one day she was on Instagram and she saw this group South Africans in New York and then there was a WhatsApp group and she says she got into the WhatsApp group she says the jokes are similar like people talk about stuff from home we're, we're, we're just about to have a cricket game she came there dripped in the colors and the flag she had food from home and now she's one of the drivers and she's a leader in the community she was actually on the panel by the way my friend so like so you realize that like this, these communities like they literally give people like the second win uh, as, 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 as a diasporic living uh, uh, away from home so like they they, they, they they crucial like they they literally like the lifeline of away from home no that, that that's really beautiful I yeah. was um looking also since doing my research you have been on the social media what does uh, Munzazi clothing Mzanzi Mzanzi Mzanzi, Mzanzi. 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 Mzanzi is colloquial for South Africa slang. Uh-huh. It just means South Africa. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. So is that Mzanzi, your clothing line? No, no. no. Uh, you talk about Matosa. Are you talking about the socks that I wear? What in particular are you talking about? So you were doing a shoot where you had. Um, oh, that, that's uh, that's my friend from Kenya. He might got a got a brand called Jamuri. Ah, and then yeah. Mzanzi was the T-shirt. Yeah. So what he did, like he actually has a Kenyan. So he had a he had a he he created a reg- regional specific. So he had like a Nigerian one. So he got a Nigerian brother who he thought like oh, wow. exemplifies Nigeria. So like for him, I was a representative of South Africa. So like he created like a special. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. No, that's, that, that, that's yeah. beautiful. That was cool. Yeah. And I saw, I'm yeah. like, oh wow, why are these t-shirts or whatever stuff being sold? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a beautiful, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful African brand. Uh, J-A-M-H-U-R-R-I, Jamuri. It's Swahili for freedom. Um, He's actually an interesting brother. You should get him. Uh, he's actually one of the first, one of the, the pioneers in terms of African street brands. Uh, as, as early nice. back as 2002, he had Jay-Z on summer stage wearing his brand. He had Akon. So he's been one, way before it was cool to be African. He was there. So for me, also, um, Nancy, I, as a philosophy, I, from the top to up, I only wear an African brand. So this is daily paper. Uh, so that's why I only wear, so like I, I'm an, I'm a work advocate for Africa and, and, and my friends. So you realize that these clothes that we wear, they, 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 they say something about you. As much as you were in the concrete part of the shirt, that yeah. says something about you. So for me, when I walk out, like I'm a representation of my. So that's why I always wear uh, brands uh, that are black owned. But my priority, my priority, always first to wear brands that are owned by Africans. Is it because you understand how um, branding works? Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, you 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 said it earlier. Uh, being a storyteller, you know, I, I I'm from Nike. I'm from Yam Brand. So like, yep. I'm a classically trained marketer. So everything you tell, everything you say is a story. From the shoe that you're wearing, from the shirt that you mentioned with the shoe, the sock, it's a story. So for me, I always try to tell a cohesive African story. So like, my clothes are a representation of the people that I represent. So today you posted something on social media. Like I said, guys, whoever is not following him, please do follow. Uh, you were talking about how we are not the same. Um, and you had the African map on there. Yeah, yeah. And um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, you asked and you responded. But for anybody who's not following you on social media, I think this would be a great opportunity for you just to uh, to be in depth with what you say. Um, so I'll make it as to you. You were asking to ask, um, do you feel deep within you a strong bond of being an African? I'm, I, I'm adding to it over there. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm a fan of the great uh, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, uh, the father of uh, Af- uh, Pan-Africanism, the first president of Ghana. He said that um, you are not African because you're born in Africa. You're African because Africa is born in you, right? Um, so for me, I, I, I have the privilege of both. I was born on the continent, but Africa is born in me very much. So like our story is very much what punctuates me, what drives me as a person, you know? Um, so I, I very much identify with, with the people of Africa uh, very much, um, you know, um, um, che Guevara used to say that if you tremble with indignation, then you're a comrade of mine. So for me, like our stories are so much steeped in uh, the narratives that I arouse. So like as a storyteller, as a marketer, as a child of Africa, I identify very much correcting uh, all these misnomers. David Livingston didn't find uh, the Victoria Post. So like so part of me uh, identifying as a storyteller like that. That's why I left Copo back and doubled down and served Africa and served underserved communities and tell these stories the right way because until lions have a biographer, tales of hunting will always glorify the hunter. So that's why African stories have always been told through the lens of whites and white saving us. So let me not say whites, but Westerners being our saviors, which is not true. David Livingston, he was lost when he found those Musiwatunya. They call yes, Musiwatunya, those folks. Yeah. Yes, he didn't discover them. So it's up to us that know the correct is misnomers. So I very much identify with Africa, my sister. I I, uh, I, I think I'm, 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 I, 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 I'm the living embodiment of what Marcus Garvey, Walter Rodney, and Diana, Kruma, Cabral in, in, in Guinea, even, you know, even Kaunda, like all these people, like they all left with me, like if you had to cut me, like they spirit, their blood causes through my veins as well. Believe me, I, sh- I saw it uh, the first day <laughs> I met you and when I went on the social media, I'm looking, you have the blanket, I don't know, the, um, yeah. I'm sorry if I'm, <laughs> I don't even uh, yeah, know what, what it's called, uh, but you had it on the train, I died yeah. when I saw that <laughs> picture. I was like, oh, 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 this is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, it's called Siana Marena. It's a it's a traditional Sasutu blanket. Uh, in our culture, the the color of your blanket dictates your your, your standing in society. Uh, so it's interesting if yeah, if uh, in popular culture that those blankets were seen in that movie Black Panther. That's uh, what so that it reminded me of. It reminded me of that, Black Panther when I saw the blanket and when you got yeah. on the panel, you got the yeah. blanket and tied it yeah. up. I'm like, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, Ryan Coogler, the director. Of, of, of Black Panther, he spent a year in the sort of research. So if you watch that movie again, like it talks about mountainous people, blankets, a wise leader, those are Basotho, King Mushesha, the first king of the Basotho, he's known yeah, as the most yeah. diplomatic African uh, leader, you know, the sort of mountainous. So for me, it's about taking back our narrative because if we're not careful, people will think these blankets come from Black Panther, but we've been, we, my people have been wearing those things since the 1500s, you know what I mean? So it's part of, it's about, it's about me taking back the narrative of, of who I am as a person. I mean, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's my pride as an actor. It's winter, guys. These things are effective. I wear my blanket, take it off. Why must I wear layers and layers? We're Africans, guys. We, we've had solutions. But like, that's what I'm saying. Like, we have these solutions, but it's just that we, we've been afraid to shop as Africans in the West. So for me, I'm not afraid to shop as an African. I, I'm authentically very African. Yeah, no, beautiful, beautiful. It, it, yeah. The thing is, I was just proud to <laughs> see that. I'm like, this is actually on the train. Okay, yeah. on the train. Can, can, I, can I tell you what's funny? Uh, at some point, I think about two months, Ago to 
was cold and I wore, there was something here in a Columbus Circle by Times Square. So, you know me, I wore my blanket, I was on the train. And then we got to the part, this guy's like, yo, man, I don't know what that is, but we need to get it to export to our, uh, he's like, yo, my guy. So, you realize that these things that we think, they, they embarrass and like they inspire other people. Yeah, no, definitely, no? definitely. Yeah. And being New York, the, the city mm. of diversity and people can see mm. an opportunity mm. anywhere. Mm. Anywhere. Yeah, no, that yeah. Is, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Yeah. So you are out of the corporate space. Yeah. How was that coming out of the corporate space? Because a lot of us are struggling here. Uh, it, it was, look, the the, the, the the tension points are always there. You know what I mean? Like the secure salary versus entrepreneurship and all these things, right? But for me, honestly, uh, it was, like I said, for me, legacy was becoming a thing. So I turned 40 in, 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 uh, in April. So like the last two years, I've just been asking myself, was my legacy going to be that I was a global a head of account management at BBDO and I worked on Star- I worked on Facebook for Mark Zuckerberg and I moved yeah. them from Facebook group to Meta and Starbucks but I realized my legacy I want my legacy to be that you know what that guy man he, this is what he did for the content and I realized that I have the network I have the experience I have the expertise why don't that so I literally I realized that I can affect these solutions for, for my people I don't need a corporate backing or these resources but if I can if I can collaborate at the intersection of my discipline with other peers who a guy who could be an accountant or a designer we, we, we can have we can have these systems without having to have a corporate structure so I think honestly my friend what my, my, my advice to people is that while you're in corporate you should be using that to like for the next move you can't be stagnant right so test the world test entrepreneurship as a corporate like test, be a podcaster for a few months if it's not working then go back and go to the like, refine yeah. keep refining like I, I just didn't wake up and say okay this morning I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna resign it was it was a, it was a conversation that I've been having internally for five years asking my mentor I was asking my partner, you know, like, is this the right, is this the right, the right decision? But I realized that the future is African. I'm an African. I'm an authentic African. I live, I, I live in, I live in a city that takes like, if, if people, people sneeze in New York, the world catches a cold. And, and I realized that people are looking towards my continent and I live here. Yeah. It's the right time. It's now or never, you know, I re- it was actually now or never. And that's, if, if, if as a business person, if, if, if you're a person of sound mind, like you fancy yourself, if you're not looking towards Africa as a solution, then you, then, then and you, you're punching in the dark because the future is very much African. If you look at the numbers population-wise, we, 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 we are home to the youngest population. If you look at the, if, even like spending power, we spend even more. If, if you look at the, the size of the middle class, what's happening in Africa is, is, is quite unique because in the West, the more money families are making, they're having less kids. But on the continent, the more money we make, we have more kids. So that so what, what that is telling us that by 2030, Africa is going to be exporting that the largest middle class. So we're not going to be coming to the Western ships and and, and begging and, and jumping walls. They're going to be permanent to hire. So it's guys like us that see that the future is African that are taking the risk right now and paying the pathway for the... Because I'm, I'm nothing compared to these other guys that are coming after. They're smarter than us. They're hungrier than us. Yeah. They're, not, they're not as jaded as like, You know what I mean? Yeah. No. So you, you, you're, you're definitely so right. You're definitely right. Here. I'm not sure if you attended um, Busi and um, her team uh, Benga organized mm. the US Africa Business Week. Yes. I attended two days of that. You... Oh my my God, the mm. representation from Africa, the opportunities mm. that we mm. have is mm. mind blowing. The mm. investment opportunities, mm. just it, from all over the uh, Africa. Absolutely, and, it, and, and 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 yeah, like the, like it, 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 you know, it'll be it'll be parochial if I said blue sky because sky has a limit. Like it's actually limitless the opportunities for the company. You know, I'm like with, within within two months of having left, I picked up two key clients. I picked up so in the tourism space and the sports space. Like, that's where I. That's that's, 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 that's where, where you I, are. I've mm-hmm. owned it because what I'm doing is that a lot of the ministries of tourism on the continent. I'm saying, guys, you are barely, you are barely stretching at the surface of the beach of South Africa. So to, you need to be amplifying this thing, like you, like Lesotho. Like for me, like pitch was simple. Lesotho was not Black Panther. You guys are not even talking about hey, these blankets. I see no Black Panther. We're from here. Something as simple as that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So now, like because we live in the West and we see how much of our countries and our culture are inspiring them, I just simply get on the phone. I, I'm, I'm telling these guys that's how I'm getting business so it's about being being having your eyes peeled open here in the West and looking for the opportunity and then taking the opportunity and then going back home because as you know in Africa people are not going to give you things on a silver platter you also have to prove to them that you're actually worth your, your you know your pound and salt you know? so like, yeah. it, it's, such, it's such a beautiful challenge for me like I, I am, I'm challenging myself as an entrepreneur but I'm also challenging the status quo like I, I'm fully alive right now you know what I mean no, I think you're going to do phenomenal you're already doing great uh, you've done great in, in 
the corporate space and this is just you giving back but seeing opportunities from here taking them back home which is great are you going to Zambia? you know what I'm supposed to be in Lusaka in November because I'm going to job I'll be joking by the end of this month because I've got some business there but uh, Lusaka Lusaka I need to be there I have so much family there great friend of mine is a guy called Kalusha Wali I don't know if you know him uh, he's, a le- he's a legendary football player uh, I know him so well he's, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, he's a great friend of mine um, you know I'm trying to I'm trying to get into I'm trying to do some work with Zifa do some some football stuff also tourism so it's a, it's a matter of time maybe maybe me and you can do a podcast out of out of Lusaka on the Zambezi River one, one of yes one of I, I am down for it I am so yeah, down yeah. just call uh, uh, we're, we're down uh, I'm no down. we should do that because I mean I've got this thing called I don't know if you've heard I've, I've got this uh, South African event called Pianos in the Yard uh, I'm a piano we curate like a, every second son in the backyard so so part of me going back home we're also going to as, as much as we presented this experience in, in, in New York part of our message the guys here we're saying as much as we do better to express it in South Africa in December so yeah. we, we have over 30 guys coming to SA in December but part of doing that in Jova we're going to Botswana we're going to have a Yanos in the yard they want to go to Lesotho Maputo so literally it's, it's I'm, a, I'm exporting culture both ways you know it's, it's, it's a true exchange of culture so as much as we live here we can... want them to come to our, to our place in December I'm to down. express our warmness yeah. no, I'm down I, I, I love it play. you've just shot me how small the world is huh? it's very small you know you know you and, and, and that's what New York does New York, New York takes away like the year of scale and I think that's what's inhibiting a lot of our our our, our peers back home on, on like, you, you think oh if I'm in Lusaka how am I going to get that guy in Kigali to get to the guy in, in Lagos and London but here you yeah. realize that it's actually a WhatsApp text away yep. by, tap, by tapping into the diaspora like I have a sister who's Zambian who has a friend who see who's a sister who's who's got connections yeah. in Uganda you know like it's that simple it's that simple and that's mostly what I do. I, I yeah. send a text, I send WhatsApp or mm-hmm. an email, or, and it, it just it. happens. It just happens. It. No, I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah. When you're gonna be in Zambia in SA, uh, definitely we can do a few episodes. Um, I am down to showcase what you are up to. I, I'd love that, cause, and and I think I, I'd love that, and and maybe like we 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 tailor making it like a tourism piece, like we should like maybe the backdrop is like something beautiful because we have to show the beauty of our continent as we as, as much as as much as we talk about the beauty, there's a, there's a, there's an element of us showing it, right? Like in advertising, like we say, show and tell. And I think a lot of a lot of and and I think it's 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 more so for the Africans of the diaspora that live here, right? Like we know how beautiful Zambia is, we know how beautiful yeah. the Victoria Park, the the, the the Zambezi is, but we need to show these people. They they've been to Paris because they see it in all these movies. So it's up to us, storytellers. And that's why my social media, I'm intentionally only speaking about my continent. Oh my God, you are very yeah. intentional. I love yeah. that you are intentional yeah. about that. Yeah. And um, it, it's really like an inside of what people should know mm-hmm. about who Africans are. Mm-hmm. And That's when you go in there every single day, like mm. literally, do you manage your social media? Yeah, hey, by myself, yeah. I'm intentional with my language. Like I, I read, because like, I'm, I'm a reader. Beautiful writing. I love words. Thank Beautiful. you so much. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Such Thank a storyteller. You. Like I, I'm you. like, wow. This is, <laughs> yeah. no, really, really good. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Could you. Literally make a book just from what you are writing every single day and it's every like few hours you are posting yeah. so it's really amazing no I, I really appreciate I really appreciate that because you know um, part of part of that is also cathartic for me I'm, I'm reminding myself of the beauty of our people honest and as, as I do that you, you'll be surprised about the number of people that say Mosito please don't stop because you are reinstilling in the fight that I that I was taught we don't have as a people you realize that you know for me I thought I was doing it for myself but you realize and, 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 and I'm not saying I'm doing it for other people but you realize that there is connection in language there's connection in shared desire ability and curiosity yeah. so that's what it's doing for me like it's actually fought by my child my sister so I'm also finding so much joy in this so I'm not going to stop because I'm realizing that God has given me the ability to tell stories and like in that I'm educating other people that are seeking this education No, oh, beautiful Yeah. since you're going to be December January African Cup is coming are you going to be yes. through that time with uh, your, your your friend yeah, Kalusha, I hope Kalusha, so Kalusha, I, yeah, I saw uh, it's coming. It's going to be East Africa for the first time. I'll definitely, I mean, I'll definitely be there. Quite a few friends in Cap. I'm going to be there for networking perspective, but also just as a as a, as a football fanatic, you know. Yeah, because you're in this space. Yeah. So I'm like, are you yeah. going to stay the whole time from November to February? Right now, my schedule has me coming back in, in January, but I'll probably extend to like mid then. No, <laughs> I'm definitely going to be there. Knowing myself, I'm, I'm going to stay beyond it. Um, I'm, I'm, I picked up some project in um, in Harare, so I'm excited about that so 
uh, in late January. So I uh, definitely, you know, me, you know, honestly, I'm up at 3 a.m. Every morning I look, I check my inbox, so yeah, I've got something driving me to the continent. I'm, I, I always want to go to the continent. No, I love it. Is there yeah. anything else I have we haven't covered? And I know we can't cover your whole life in an hour's uh, span. But is there anything you you have on your chase that maybe I have you wanted to share with the audience to get a better understanding of you? No, I mean not so much my on my chest, but I think if anything, I just it's just, a, it's just I just want to impart some you know some words that life is to be lived, you know, and to live life we have to find the the, the meaning of, of what things are that that we want to get out of it. So for me, like I said, my purpose honestly is storytelling and, and creating and amplifying Africa. So I think as a person, identify what your purpose is, and it's it, it, it's not anything abstract, guys. If you if, if sometimes like what you love is what you love, double down on that. Double down on that. Well said. Well said. Yeah. You definitely amplify Africa uh, representation all the way. Have, have you found your concrete pastures? Do you feel fulfilled to where you are right now? One hundred percent. You know, it, the timing of this question is is crazy because had you asked me this a month ago, I'd say I'm still searching. But I found them. You know, the funny thing is, I found myself again. Like you know, like life is not a straight road. Like I sort of detoured. Yeah. So now, like, so this guy was waiting for me. So that's why I speak with so much clarity. You know, that purpose was this, that purpose was telling African stories and amplifying African stories. But most importantly, creating a pathway for African creatives so they can create an inhibitor. And that is what I'm that, and that is what I'm doing. My 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 purpose. I would say from now until till God takes the gift of birth away from me, my life is going to be a love letter for Africa. And 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 and, and by that I mean creating a platform for African creators to create because that's where the inspiration is coming from. We need to inspire the world, and that is coming from Africa. And I realize that I'm the missing the creator pocket for these guys that I get to inspire. So I've definitely found um, a concrete customer. I love that love letter um, analogy of it. I love it. Yeah, beautiful. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, this has been so much fun I know we, we are going to collaborate on so many um, yeah. projects so this is not the last you seeing this man here he's yeah. going to be here with me and I'm excited on what we're going to be working on yeah. so I appreciate you this has been an honor thank you so no, much, thank you much for making time thank you. thank you so much and thank you for creating dialogue you know what you're doing is very important uh, because you know Africans uh, we are messengers we are creators you are messengers so you are creating a safe space for us to be ourselves so thank you so much man Thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah. That's it on today's episode. It's truly an honor to serve each and every dreamer. Concrete Pressures now provides targeted services to dreamers coming to the US of A. We assist you to successfully integrate. We are here to support you as you write your new chapter. Kindly check out our services in the link tree. Until next time, keep dreaming.